And so welcome everybody. My name is Rafael Vasquez. I teach in the humanities department and I teach humanities six and I teach humanities 23. Humanities six is uh, the different cultures in the United States. And I focus on the Irish and the Latinx and the African-American community. And I also teach uh, Humanities 23, which is Latin America and the Caribbean. But today we wanna talk about coming back to college, coming back to Santa Rosa Junior College, that is, where students are getting back into the classrooms. And so for some people, there is a lot of anxiety. We are dealing with depression. We're dealing with a lot of mental health. The state of California is working on putting money out there into the communities, uh, whether it is uh, community agencies, whether it is colleges, universities, to be able to provide the mental health services that our students are going to need now that we are coming back into the classroom. And so I wanted to have this dialogue in regards to life after COVID and how our students and our personal lives have changed. So I want you to take a deep breath and I want you to imagine how has COVID changed your life a lot of us, again, we may have lost family members or friends. I myself personally, I haven't lost a family member directly, but in less than a month, I have lost two friends, none of them to COVID, interestingly, but I couldn't go see them in the hospital. I couldn't go say goodbye. And a lot of us and a lot of our students are dealing with this. Many of us, again, are basically incarcerated in our own homes, and yet, you know, we are expected to keep going, to work with students, to facilitate meetings, to just, again, empower the students that we're working with. And so, again, as I'm talking, I want you to imagine how your life has changed and how, again, the lives of our students have changed. What does that mean? It means that there's a lot of anxiety from the point of view that the latest uh, response or information I got yesterday from the county of Sonoma is that 41.6% of 12 to 15 year olds in Sonoma County are not vaccinated. And you know, the students are sitting next to each other in the classrooms today. That creates anxiety for individuals. The fact that 31% uh, of 16 to 24 year olds in Sonoma County are not vaccinated. And for those of us who are choosing to teach in person, we are doing it with that understanding. Maybe you didn't know it was that high, but it is that high according to the county of Sonoma. Individuals are choosing not to get uh, vaccinated. Some of the other younger children is not a choice. Their parents are saying, no, you're not gonna get vaccinated and therefore they are dealing with the consequences. And so it's important. I had a, an email recently from a parent who said, I wanna thank you for going back into the classroom. And I said, well, this is what we do, we teach. And she said, yeah, but my student, my daughter hasn't been able to succeed because of COVID. Taking classes from home wasn't working for her. And I'm glad that you're taking the risk and you're getting back into the classroom because my daughter is finally excited about getting back to school. And so, Again, when I ask faculty members, when I ask colleagues at Santa Rosa Junior College and I ask people outside of Santa Rosa Junior College, how has COVID affected your life? Many individuals are saying there's a lot of anxiety in social, social situations. Should I go to this restaurant? Is it too crowded, right? The reality that masks are a new normal, right? For years and years, we saw that people in China and other countries, they would wear masks all the time. And this is our new normal. We go out, we wear masks. Some will wear the masks, some will not wear the masks, but it is a thing, right? And many individuals, it's interesting, not just politicians, but other individuals often say, well, let's get the vaccine, let's get this, let's get that so we can get back to normal. Well. Normal is not always equitable. And we're talking about education. And we'll talk more about that at Santa Rosa Junior College. Labor, right? Some of us were able to go and sit in our homes perhaps. And while that was difficult, especially for those of us who have to have a specific ergonomics, it may have been difficult to adjust, but at the same time, we didn't have to be working in the fields or we didn't have to work in other places where we were uh, standing or sitting or kneeling 
next to each other, risking again some form of uh, contagion in regards to COVID, right? Some of us, we have the privilege that we can travel in our own vehicles to work, to the store, this and that, but a lot of our students don't have that opportunity and that freedom, and they have to take public transportation, risking yet again getting the virus, taking it home, and then maybe losing their jobs because they couldn't work for a few days. And yes, there's legislation all the time. There's orders that say you cannot be evicted from your apartment. You cannot write all of these pieces. But we know that some of our students have been evicted. Some of our students have lost their housing in general during the pandemic, right? So it's not equitable in that manner. We also know that the uh, you know health services may not be available. And when I talk about health services, it's not just the physical health. I need to go get a checkup with my doctor, but the mental health services that should go with it, right? So a lot of our students, again, they don't have the resources to be able to go to a therapist on a weekly basis. And we need to uh, talk about that. In fact, in the last couple of months, I personally created my own TikTok. And it's all about mental health. Originally started with undocumented and I wanted to focus uh, mental health ideas to undocumented students through my uh, outside organization called Líderes del Futuro. But, you know, it was beautiful to see recently a woman commented, she's like, I'm not undocumented, but this material is relevant to me. So I'm following. And this is reality, right? So mental health services are essential and not everybody has access to those services. And that brings us to the question, what should we do to create equity in education? We need to hear from our students, right? I'm not sure how many surveys have been sent out by anybody else, but we need to have that. We need to have that going on all the time, right? How are, you know, what is your experience with your teachers are you getting enough housing? Are you getting enough food? You know, what is going on? And so one of the things that we need to do is we need to do research. And while we are not in a research institution, it is essential that we know what is happening with our students. So I conducted a survey that centered on the life after COVID. And uh, this was email, right? The survey was emailed to over 500 students who attend Santa Rosa Junior College. There was a total of 36 uh, responses, right? And that's to give you an idea. Now, if you're used to doing research, you know that about a 10% return is acceptable. So it was a little bit below 10%. And why is it that I'm not uh, too uh, upset or disappointed more than anything about the lack of responses? Because again, students are working, students are the last thing they wanna do in the summer is deal with their email and an additional piece of work. And so what I did is I collected the data and I uh, contacted my colleague uh, soon to be uh, uh, get a doctorate from a local university. And she has done a lot of research with different groups and we did the data analysis. And that's what I have for you because I want you and I to understand as we walk into the classrooms, as we start our Zoom meetings next week, I want us all to be aware of what services are needed, where we have done good and where we need to continue to work on. So that's the idea of this. So the findings from the research, uh, we focus on multiple things and one was, what are the perceptions of college students in regards to online learning? And again, their impact on academic performance. And so as college students were asked, how did online learning impact your academic performance? And although some college students reported that online learning did not impact their academic performance, two primary themes came up out of this. Negative influence meant lack of motivation, and external responsibilities. And then in the positive influence, again, the ability to focus, they had more time to do their assignments in regards to their academic performance. So 
Again, in the negative influence, many college students reported that online learning negatively impacted their academic performance in general. Um, and some students uh, shared that they were unable to focus on school. They experienced lack of motivation and they were unable to access various educational resources. One specific one that keeps coming up in the research is tutorial services. Students didn't seem to know how to get tutorial um, in regards to their classes. And the other one is students simply couldn't do tutoring online. They needed somebody there, somebody present to be able to support them, to teach them. And online learning in this situation didn't work for them. Many students also reported that they didn't have the laptops necessary to be able uh, to be uh, successful. Some students reported that they had requested laptops and these were not being made available, even though we kind of uh, said, I, I would say, as a college that we were going to provide that to students, they, they were put on a wait list and then those laptops were not available. And the other biggest one that we see is students would email their faculty member and there would be no responses. So a student says, it was harder to keep up with deadlines and some assignments were not turned in on time. I had some professors who never answered my questions via email and as a result, my, my grade went down. I believe that professors who teach online courses should be more accessible to have office hours. So again, you know, and we know that some of our colleagues and friends may have chosen to retire because they knew that this teaching environment wasn't for them. Uh, they didn't want to learn how to use uh, Zoom, perhaps. I myself, I'll be honest, I, it was difficult. It has been difficult to keep up with emails. It has been difficult to teach online on Zoom. You're sharing the wrong screen for a second. All of these things happen. And so it's really, really essential to recognize this. Another student said it was difficult to communicate one-on-one -on -one with the professors, but it became easier throughout the year. But there are times when professors did not, uh, still don't know how to use Zoom again and don't bother trying to communicate and make things work. I think that one of the things I wanna stop here and mention something that I know for sure, and I know for sure that students communicate with me about this. And I personally know that is difficult to basically ask as faculty to raise our hands and say, hey, somebody in the group, do you know how to do this, right? I was sharing a video in one of my first Zoom classes and I'm just enjoying the video and I'm listening to the video. And suddenly, you know, all these messages start coming in in the chat that say, we cannot hear, we can see, but we cannot hear. Well, I didn't know that you had to press the button that said that you need to share the sound from the video on Zoom, right? And it was such a humbling experience, yet I was very grateful that they raised their hand and they shared this. Some other students would just, you know, let it go. And the reality is about creating these healthy spaces. I never come into the room as an expert, and I know that in other PDA meetings I participated in years ago, some faculty members have said that they feel that they need to be the experts in the room. The way I treat all of my students is, first of all, I don't treat, I don't call them students. Everyone in the room is a colleague. The idea that they all can contribute is brings them up into a whole different level. This summer, I had a student who wasn't doing any of his work. He is a DRD student and he said, and I said, you know, I sent an email. And I said, you know, you're not passing the class at this moment. And it was interesting. Uh, you know, I said, do you need support? Whatever the situation was. And he said, you know, I know I'm not going to pass your class. I only come to your class for two different reasons. You're the first faculty member at Santa Rosa Junior College who has never talked down at me for being a DRD student. And two, the stories that you tell, that's all I come for. Right. So again, it's about engaging the students as much as possible. And so we found ways to work with that student to make sure he was going to be successful in my class. And a final example is it was hard to concentrate because at the same time, I had to take care of my little sister. Sometimes I was in the middle of my class and she had trouble logging in. 
So I had to go help her log in into her class. And in many occasions, I lost important information. So I had trouble understanding an important topic from an, uh, you know, the class. And so again, this also goes back to the idea of forcing students to have their camera on because that creates a lot of anxiety. You don't want parents walking in the background. Uh, students just feel very uneasy and, and uncomfortable about having people now come into their households. The positive influence on academic performance, again, so although some students had negative experiences, other students um, allow, you know, online learning allowed them to better focus. And they shared the following. It became easier since I was able to get all my assignments done at my own pace, which helped me balance life and work. Another student said, it allowed me to be more flexible with my schedule and decrease the travel time. And another student said, I did enjoy the slightly more time to complete assignments. So some of the faculty members also have allowed for additional time to be able to get students to do their work. And if you don't have to commute and worry about parking, it definitely supported some students to be able to be more successful and dedicate more time to their schoolwork. And then we talk about, again, the accommodations, right? So faculty and staff accommodations that help students overcome their educational challenges. And so when we ask for those uh, student, for that student feedback, and if any faculty or staff member provided students uh, help to overcome their educational challenges, two themes came up. One was extensions on assignments and two, accessibility to faculty members. And so in regards to extensions on assignments, many college students reported that one of the accommodations that they received from pro professors that helped them overcome their educational challenges was extension on assignments. I know that myself, instead of expecting my, my uh, colleagues there to turn in their homework by Wednesday at 9 p.m., I would give them extensions until Friday during my summer class because it was definitely not enough time. And so, again, extension dates, modifying assignments, extended deadlines, leniency with grading, making students feel comfortable, asking questions or express concerns. And a final example, a student who said positive changes on syllabus and or extensions. Workload was predictable, which made it easier to stay on track. And so, again, that is definitely one of the positive experiences that a lot of uh, students in this survey have shared in regards to being able to feel supported by faculty members who said, I understand that if I am going through this pandemic and I'm dealing with all these challenges, I can only imagine what my students are going through. Some faculty members have learned that the mistakes that we made during the fires of 2017, when some faculty members were still expecting students to submit uh, drafts to, for their essays or have read half of books, uh, while some of these um, while some of these students, again, were homeless, were in shelters, that that was completely unacceptable. And so therefore some faculty members are now catching on to the reality that uh, COVID is so horrible. I think I have about five of my students, maybe six of my students uh, that I have provided services through EOPS that again, have lost family members here and in other countries. And so again, understanding those challenges is essential. And then the accessibility to professors, in addition to receiving extensions on their assignments, many undocumented college students reported that the other resource offered by the professors was their accessibility. So the students said they would always respond to my emails at a reasonable and sometimes instant time. Instant was always much appreciated, by those who did so all the time. And then another student said, I think one thing that helped me was how fast I could or would get responses on email or on Canvas whenever I face issues with assignments. And again, right, as faculty members, as uh, uh, you know, colleagues uh, who are staff members, 
again, being able to be responsive to the needs. Although a lot of the information I'm putting here, it's about the classroom. Again, it's about checking those voice messages if you work in admissions, in EOPS, in other departments, and then be able to get back to our, our students as quickly as possible. Uh, one of the things I always respond via email, please, uh, thank you for your email. Please let me know the best days and times to get back to you if you would like me to get back to you via phone. And that way we avoid the back and forth for a week or two and I do the same thing over the phone. Anytime a student uh, calls in and I get the message, I call them back, I get voicemail, it's always the same. Thank you for calling. Uh, let me know when you are uh, most likely to be available and I will try to adjust my schedule to feed that, um, to be able to fit that need. And so again, being able to get back to students is essential because you know they're moving on to the next thing. And then, Again, uh, we also have to talk again about those concerns of getting back to the classroom. So I know that there's a lot of anxiety, again, to talk about 31% uh, of 16 to 24 year olds in Sonoma County not having been vaccinated as of yesterday, that is concerning, right? So the, we asked the students, how do you feel about getting back into the classroom. Are you comfortable, right? And we noticed that some of the in-person classes actually didn't fill up as fast as some of us thought. And that had to do with this. And so students said the theme here is lack of friends and social anxiety. Doing class in person, we've been in front of a computer for so long, I feel like it'll be weird at first. In all honesty, I feel like I wouldn't feel comfortable or excited to go back to the JC on campus because before the pandemic, my friend's circle was big. I was very social with everyone. I enjoy going there. I love the JC campus. The time away from the JC and the pandemic really changed the way I felt and see the JC now. It's still a great school. It's just a lot has changed and I feel like I wouldn't feel the same going back for my last class. And the student, this specific student wrote one of the longest responses on this specific question. And so that's why I had to edit uh, or shorten it, I should say, a little bit because it just keeps going on and on. Students said that they, you know, they share information about who they knew on campus, uh, colleagues they, they used to hang out with, for a period of time, the student had a job on campus and is not even comfortable going back to that job because, again, they don't want to feel, they feel anxious, but they're also concerned of people um, not having been vaccinated and coming back into the classroom. Student says, getting used to being around people again, not knowing anyone. And again, that increased social anxiety. So for me, I start teaching my, uh, my class on Humanity 6 on Tuesday. And the first thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna do a piece about mental health. I'm gonna do the 25 common behaviors of people who have been the victims of emotional abuse in childhood. Um, I'll do a lot of those type of pieces. And then of course, right? I was having this conversation just yesterday and I talk about it on my radio show about, um, you know, people say, for example, you know, uh, teachers probably don't go through the same experiences as we do as students, right? And students just put us in a different position altogether. They assume that maybe we don't go through depression, that maybe we don't, you know, have alcohol problems, this and that and the other. And what we, I think, need to do better, and I do my best in my classes, is to humanize the teacher. Yes, I still have to deal with this. Yes, I still have to do with that, right? So opening up a little bit and being vulnerable with students, what it does is it connects you with the students. Oh, they understand. They must understand what I'm going through because they are admitting that they too have some social anxiety. 
about coming back into the classroom, right? So I invite you all, if whether you are gonna be providing services to students in person in the uh, offices or uh, in the classroom, again, part of making it easier on students, it's about connecting with students from that human point of view. You know, I fully understand that some of you are having some anxiety about being in the classroom. I'm dealing with that as well, right? And so for me, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do several exercises to just normalize what we're all going through. Make sure they understand that I too, I'm going through some of these experiences. And then once they feel ready for the second hour, we can get to the material that we need to cover. But again, this is essential. Anyone who says, you know, we need to get back to normal, uh, let us remember this hasn't happened in our lifetimes, right? And the reality is based on Delta, we are still in the middle of COVID. So although this was titled Life After COVID, because I thought by now we would be, you know, we'd have everything under control, 95% of the counties in the state of California if we went back to the tier system that they had the different colors, we all would be in purple, which is why I chose this theme color, because this is when it's not over and it's not gonna be over for a long time. So I invite you to again, consider uh, being open with students about your own feelings on this. So again, in regards to COVID-19 specifically, as students said, getting used to being around people again and not knowing anyone, if this increases again, the uh, anxiety. Other students share that they are concerned of contracting COVID-19. The new COVID variants uh, came up all the time. Like we thought it was under control. Now we are learning about Delta and people are still choosing not to vaccinate. What's gonna happen? And again, all of this fear. And so it is important to hear their concerns. So a student said, you know, I have a chronic illness. Others don't wear masks properly. And again, there's new COVID variants. People are not sitting six feet apart. They are not wearing masks either and the cleanliness, right? So uh, as a college, we need to send that uh, mass email that says, look, these are the precautions we are taking, right? And just as a suggestion, a video, a quick video from President Chong saying, you know, we are doing A, B, C, D, and E is more credible than yet again, another long email that says this, 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 my opinion. And so a student also said, I am afraid that not all students and faculty are vaccinated. And again, I just give, gave you the number, the large number of students who are not vaccinated. And so again, reminding them, uh, if you need your vaccine, we're here at Santa Rosa Junior College. Um, and again, explaining to students um, what the consequences of not following protocol is essential as well. So I will definitely spend some time in the classroom the first day going over the whole protocol and respectfully letting them know if you at this moment choose not to follow protocol, you're all welcome to, you know, go find some other class, but we need to protect each other. And again, creating this communal uh, environment. And then um, the other piece that we look at in this quick survey, uh, we talk about the inaccessibility uh, to resources. So students, again, uh, have been suffering for a while. And again, it's important that we understand it. And so, Again, they said that there are issues with child care and work flexibility and teacher support and commuting. So one student said, it will not work with my school schedule to go back to, again, on-campus classes or having to find child care. Another student said, will I get enough access to help from the teacher, especially since I need more help with understanding the topics in an in-person environment? And another student spoke about online school has provided me the opportunity for a full-time teaching job. If I have to return back to campus, it would be extremely challenging to commute to school from work and back, 
right? So some students have gotten new opportunities either through their jobs, new jobs, and now coming back onto campus is gonna create some challenges for them, right? This is also where some students, there has been some dialogue about maybe Santa Rosa Junior College doesn't have the 17 week semesters, but there are some options for the 10 week semester or the six week semester to be able to get some of this work done. So again, there's many pieces uh, to this, but uh, it's important. Another item that keeps coming up is the lunch hour. And that is uh, students are talking about getting back the lunch hour. Some faculty members here, some staff members here, some administrators in this uh, conversation, maybe you're not familiar with, but we used to have the lunch hour maybe 15, 16 years ago, where between noon and one, everybody would come out. There would be absolutely no classes. Students would come out and share with each other. So this may not be necessarily now, but the students are talking about Santa Rosa Junior College creating more community in the future when everybody's get, uh, able to get back onto campus. And again, those are the things that keep coming up. Why is it that we just go class, 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 I go home, I go to work, but why is there no time for us to share, participate uh, with each other out there? And then again, uh, perceptions of support is important, right? So enforcing this COVID-19 guidelines, as I said, I'm gonna go over with my uh, uh, colleagues in the classroom the first day of class, but students are saying this, that we must insist students and staff wear masks properly, clean surfaces, and more social distance. Another student said that we really like for masks to be still required in certain classes where there will be a lot of people. Again, I'm excited about returning to in-person, but I am still concerned. And finally, another student said uh, that we need to enforce the guidelines of the health department. So again, there's a lot of anxiety and it is essential that we communicate with the uh, community, with the faculty, staff, and students about what are the many steps that are being taken. And again, uh, it is essential that they feel comfortable to be able to be on campus and in the classroom. In regards to providing resources, which is again, another theme here, some students shared that faculty and staff can support their transition to in-person teaching by providing students with more resources, such as childcare and um, asynchronous teaching components, again, increased time in assignments. And one uh, student specifically said, we must provide asynchronous along with in-person classes and open up the childcare center on campus. Another student said they can ease into the work, right? And another student said, I think that we should continue to provide online instruction for almost all classes to better serve and support students that have other obligations outside of school, such as work and family. So again, if there's no childcare on campus, some students still have to stay home and take care of their children perhaps, uh, because again, childcare centers are not necessarily accessible. And so again, this is why conducting this type of research is essential uh, in order to be able to understand what's going on with students, right? In order to be able to understand as a community college, how we can support the students, what resources are needed. And as a result of that, the students can be successful. We don't want them dropping out of the uh, classes, uh, in-person classes, for example, in the middle of the semester, it affects or you know uh, money from the state, but also the students' lives are affected, right? They are delays uh, into this. And then the other piece that we talk about with students in the survey is again, what do you want faculty to know, right? So again, giving a little bit more time on assignments, again. What do you want the administration to know? Okay, open up the child care center, so on and so forth. But again, uh, in regards to what else can they do? 
And they said, we need the staff and the faculty to show empathy towards students' needs um, so that they can help them transition to in-person teaching. And so as students said, be more aware that people cannot learn something in a day, week, or through a textbook, especially. Another student said, we definitely need to listen to students and work with them on common issues. And another student spoke about just knowing that we have somebody, you know, uh, that could hear us. Again, it's important, again, to be able to do that with students. Recently, um, checking with a student who just needed to fill out a form led to a 15-minute check-in because it was obvious just in the tone of voice of the student that there was something going on, right? And all they needed was just to vent for a few minutes. You know, the semester is not um, ready yet, but I suggested to the student started Monday, starting Monday, checking with mental health services on campus, right? I also gave them some resources for off campus and online resources for mental health. And again, that is essential, excuse me, empathy, showing empathy, not just handing out assignments and saying it's due on this day at this time, and I don't care how you do it, but it has to be done, but really just being there, right? And doing this check-in. Uh, it was interesting, I was in another meeting and students uh, reported that one of our faculty members in uh, uh, English department, uh, one of the assignments that he does on a regular basis or on a weekly basis in one of his classes for sure is that students turn in their needs homework, right? So the students write on a piece of paper, what are their needs for that week? Well, maybe food, right? Maybe mental health, right? And not everybody's gonna do this type of assignment, but the reality is again, creating a healthy space, even in the classroom and during office hours to be able to get students comfortable enough to have this type of conversations with us. We do not have to be experts on everything. We can say, okay, mental health, let me direct you to mental health services. You have questions about food, let me direct you to that uh, you know, support. Let's refer you to the success coaches and they have connections to all of these other tools, right? And sometimes all they need is just to listen, somebody to listen for their needs because often these students don't have the support at home. And a lot of students, what I've been talking about for a while now is their childhood trauma, right? Just got, had gotten uh, triggered by the fires, 2017, 19 and 20. And now what we have is COVID that doesn't seem to wanna go away. And therefore, again, those triggers are there constantly. And so again, be a, being able to create a safe, safe space, being able to be empathetic, being able to listen and then refer them to the individual uh, resources. And that is the next area that we need to discuss. Campus resources that students are excited to utilize. Counseling services. For many students, including undocumented students, counseling services is a resource that uh, students are excited to utilize upon coming back. One student said, you know, the counseling office is where I wanna be, right? Another student referred to the library. Students, uh, especially undocumented students in the survey responded that they are looking forward to using the library upon the return to in-person teaching. Now. If the library is not gonna be open, again, we need to communicate this to students as soon as possible because their perception, right? The last survey was turned in on Sunday. So obviously their in, uh, understanding of coming back to campus, it may be different than our understanding as an institution. So the student said, I'm looking forward to using the library as a quiet space to study and connect with friends. I know that in the summer, we had tables right out here outside Bertolini Hall. Um, so again, being able to communicate that information to students and not just in writing, but again, some type of video would be essential for them to go over. And tutorial services. Again, 
Um, it this we saw mainly with undocumented students who showed this and they said that they want to, um, uh, you know, go to tutorial services because at home they don't have a mom or dad who already went to college maybe and can help them uh, find the right resources or can tutor them in a specific subject. So maybe nobody at home has a degree in psychology or engineering or any of the uh, of the kind so using our tutorial services in person is what the students are talking about and of course the food pantry right many students share that they're looking forward to using the food pantry uh, during in-person teaching as you well know or maybe you do not know but for a while now santa rosa has been santa rosa junior college has been providing we used to have a kiosk over by the football field and students would just line up for a couple of hours and get those services. During the pandemic, arrangements have been made um, by the institution and every month uh, colleagues, including myself, will be out there uh, in the um, parking lot, just passing out food, passing out information. The last time we were giving out information about financial aid, EOPS, as well as we were giving out information about vaccinations and vaccinations were happening and people were getting their vaccine at the time. So again, the food pantry is essential for a lot of our students. And some of those students qualify for a $50 gift card so they can also go buy some food when they run out of the uh, items that we are providing with the food bank. And then many of our students, uh, again, now moving us to some of them are undocumented, not all of them in these responses. Uh, but some uh, college students shared that faculty, staff, and administration can help undocumented um, students as they transition to in-person teaching by giving them emotional support. Again, making them feel heard, understand their stressful position. And so one example is um, the student said uh, that faculty and staff need to understand the stress we're constantly facing give a safe environment as well as make us feel wanted, right? So students are really needing the emotional support. And again, listen for a few minutes. And then if it seems like it requires additional assistance, again, going to receive mental health services. Um, let us be also aware that in many of the undocumented communities, for sure in the Latinx community, um, Talking about therapy is not something that they're just always going to buy into. Parents and other individuals will say only crazy people go to therapy, right? And therefore saying, you know, whatever happens at home, whatever has happened at home is not something that you go and tell the world. And so some of the students will have some, unfortunately, natural um, aversion to considering uh, therapy. And therefore, Again, sometimes they trust their faculty member just to tell them a few things, right? I was giving the example as well the other day as to how sometimes here in Bertolini Hall in the past, I have conducted this exercise with faculty and other colleagues in the past, which for some people is um, a shocking thing. Um, but, you know, we are so used to just walking by each other. Hey, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you? Okay, bye. Right. And so sometimes with certain individuals, uh, will, they will say, hey, Rafael, how are you? This is pre-COVID. Hey, Rafael, how are you? Oh, I'm doing good. How are you? Right. So instead of saying I'm good, when they ask, how are you doing it? Like, you know what? Thank you for asking. Now that you ask, um, I actually needed to talk to somebody about how I'm feeling. And what happens? That person is so in shock because they were not expecting that. And so what I'm telling people is like, maybe come up with a different way if you're not, if you don't have the time, because this is gonna happen on campus as we get back. If you know you don't have the time to stop and speak with a student for five minutes, um, you know, while they're walking on campus and they just need somebody to talk to, then use a different type of greeting so that you don't uh, end up in a situation that you're uncomfortable maybe, or you were not expecting, right? 
And so it's a teaching moment for uh, colleagues, staff, faculty, and other individuals, um, because this is going to happen. Hey, how are you? And if somebody says, oh, well, you know, I'm having a hard time with my class or my teacher doesn't seem to understand that I was late because of this or whatever the situation is, right? Let's come up with a more supportive way where students will be acknowledged, their presence is acknowledged, but again, we know that we don't have the time, right? And so I always, um, well, recently I've been thinking about maybe creating a flyer of my own. And when I'm walking to my classroom, for example, just having that flyer and anybody who needs it, right? In my jacket, I wear a green ribbon that basically green means go. Like I'm open to talk about, you know, check-ins if you need that as far as mental health, and I'll refer you to other places, right? Or maybe coming up with a button that says, you know, whatever it is that the community college is going to determine is appropriate. But again, I invite you to let's not just say hi, bye really quickly. If that's what you need to do, then make it clear that you don't have the time to do anything more. But a lot of check-in is necessary. Students are gonna need that. Faculty and staff are gonna need that when we see again each other starting next week. And continuing with this, again, it says being patient and uh, socially aware that undocumented students are struggling at the moment or lives are uncertain. And sometimes we're just trying our best to live with that. For some people, it is not easy to speak up for fear of being targeted. And so when talking about these issues, it is important to understand that there are many people listening, but not participating in this discussion. And so for our undocumented people, and I'll focus uh, here for a second, as you may or may not know, many of our students have DACA, which is a temporary reprieve from deportation we have had that program since 2012. And a Texas judge just determined that DACA is illegal. It is being appealed now to the fifth uh, district court by the Justice Department and MALDEV and other organizations. And then likely it will end up in the United States Supreme Court one more time, where in about two years, maybe a little bit longer, it will likely be um, uh, gotten rid of. And so as a result of that, a lot of the students I'm communicating with, uh, they don't know what to do. Should I even go to college? Because if DACA disappear, am I gonna be able to practice in the area that I am studying, whether it is nursing, whether it is engineering, whether it is a psychologist. And so often we are having these conversations with students. So I wanted to make sure that you're aware that if in your classroom, the conversation about immigration comes up, because it's one of the topics that you cover, I cover it in my class, um, that again, you are aware of what's happening because it could be triggering to some of these uh, students. And finally, another student said, make them feel heard, supported, and provide study spaces and safe spaces as many don't have safe spaces at home. And so it is essential, again, that uh, you know, we create all these safe spaces. And in the past, I have given out all these um, window signs that say this is a, a, a safe space for undocumented students. I have some left, I have about 40 of them left. If this is something that you think that you would like to have, um, you're more than welcome to email me and then you can get that from me via inter-office mail. Um, and again, you can put it on your window, you can put it in your classroom, whatever it is that uh, you feel that it is appropriate. And yes, a lot of students don't have space at home. Sometimes you have three students, four students connecting to their different classes. Um, and this happened last year more than now because students are going K-12 back into the classroom. But you had all these students connecting and then they would drop out of the class because the bandwidth wasn't good enough or you know, it was simply not enough for the class. And so it is important that we, again, are uh, patient, that we are empathetic with all of the students. Just during this conversation, we've had three colleagues who have come into this chat and I'm assuming because of the signal, um, you know, they, their call just dropped in Zoom and so they came back. And so it's, it's important for us 
to be uh, caring and patient and empathetic, which is the most important thing. And so I, I invite you to again, have this type of conversation. Uh, and, you know, again, for me, just walking into the classroom and being able to see students in person is going to energize me to be able to give them my best. But I also know that I need that extra energy to be as caring and empathetic as I need to be with my students, especially because some of the topics that I cover are very, very um, emotional. And then the other piece, material support. So what can we do for undocumented students? And again, the, the people who responded to the survey were undocumented and uh, US citizens and residents of the country. So we just threw the uh, invitation out there to a lot of students, um, but I did have a question about undocumented students and undocumented student support. And so it says some college students shared that faculty, staff and administration can help undocumented college students as they transition to in-person teaching by giving them material support such as financial resources. So I did check yesterday and the financial aid website has been changed. Um, and so students have to look a little bit more to try and figure out where the uh, financial assistance is, the emergency fund. Um, and again, I've been uh, having 10, 15, 20 conversations with students via Zoom, via phone call every day for the last couple of weeks. And most of them uh, don't know that there is an emergency fund. And so again, I've been sending them that link. So I invite you to end your classes to let students know the first day of class. By the way, some of you may be dealing with different challenges, including economic challenges. Uh, please check in about the uh, emergency fund over at Financial Aid um, because students need this. Some students are now gonna have to leave their jobs or hours of, from work to be able to come on campus. So what they say is have available resources, again, financially. Uh, another student said financial aid. And I think that administration can support undocumented students by demonstrating solidarity and providing resources that might be needed. Again, uh, if we are not talking about the financial support that is available for all students, then again, you know, if we are honestly gonna look uh, everything through an equity uh, lens, then we really need to ask ourselves before making decisions, the institution always has to ask itself, is this equitable? And if not, how do we make it equitable? And again, as a faculty member, I feel the need to be very direct and honest with all of you um, because it's the only way that we are going to best advocate for all students on campus. And then the last uh, piece of information that I have here from the research, and then I'll stop the recording so that we can have a Q&A or conversation is about informational support. So some undocumented college students shared that faculty, staff and administration can help undocumented college students as they transition to in-person teaching by giving them information and support such as shared resources that undocumented college students can utilize or apply. Again, remind them of the programs that can help them succeed and where to go for that kind of help, who to get in communication with. Another student said more information about the opportunities for undocumented students. And finally, that students should be informed on the type of things that provide good info, right? And again, the quotes are written as they were written to us. So if there's misspellings or anything, I didn't correct it. We wanna be as, uh, as transparent to you as possible. And so students uh, need more support for sure. Students need, um, uh, you know, to be heard and students need to have an opportunity to tell us uh, what services they need. So I invite uh, administration to again, do a survey that is more inclusive, that is targeted so that then all students can participate. And so this is what I have for you. I'm gonna turn to the next slide. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna stop recording so that then we can have a dialogue. I didn't wanna talk all day. Um, I know I could, but I wanted to be able to, again, have the opportunity for any one of you 
to share some questions or comments, all of them are valid. 